I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Good morning, Victor. We're so glad that you're in the house. Maybe you're watching online. I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. I invite you to stand as we sing together. Here we go. Live Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and claim your victory. Let it rise. 
On Mother's Day, my mind can't help but go directly to the mother of Jesus, Mary herself, who raised Jesus from an infant, toddler, teenager, went through many of the same struggles that all of us do because she was an earthly mother, blessed but an earthly mother. But one day she found herself at the foot of a cross feeling extreme anxiety. I can only imagine the extreme anxiety, helplessness, maybe even a bit of hopelessness, but clinging to what her son said would happen in three days, that he would rise again. And she stood there with tears falling down. He died on that cross. But praise God, three days later, she herself was at the empty tomb when that stone was rolled away and she got to go and declare the news that Jesus Christ had truly risen from the dead. There wasn't hopelessness, there was hope and there was fulfillment in the promise that God made that his son would truly rise again. I can't imagine the joy that was in her heart as a mother, as a believer, I, I just can't comprehend it. And as we move into this time of communion, I pray that as mothers in this room and everyone in this room, that if you're having feelings of anxiety, of helplessness, of hopelessness, that you will cling to the fulfillment that God himself did through the empty tomb, that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave and that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. That you will cling to that through all of your days. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we get to honor our mothers. But more than that, we wanna honor you for the fulfillment of you raising from the dead, for the fulfillment of your sacrifice that we have a chance to have eternal life, that you came through, that you always come through, that you are there for us. Thank you. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Mother's Day for me because I get to baptize both of my two sons today. Uh, this is AJ, he's 15, and that's Austin, he's 13. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. And repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God, and I accept him, and I accept him as my Lord and my Savior. As my Lord and my Savior. AJ, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is my 
son Cameron. He's come to be baptized today. Cameron, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. Repeat after me. I believe, I believe that, Jesus that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Son of living God. I accept him as my Lord. I accept him as my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Okay. Cameron, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Son of the Living God, and I accept Him now. And I accept Him now as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Awesome. It's because of this confession that I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit.
Take your seat. We're going to go into a time of generosity. And what I love about this next section is this is from the fruit of our labor, from the fruit of our generosity. Back in November when we did Above and Beyond, uh, we gave towards a mission in Papua New Guinea. We have Ryan Hardy there, and he's translating the Bible, but we gave to, to give water to these people who had unclean water source. I'm so excited. We've got quite the story to tell today. So take a look at this video, and then Josh is going to follow it up. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And that is exactly what we were able to do as a church. That was the sound of the Sob uh, tribe. They live in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they're praising God because of our collective generosity. Like Aaron said, at the end of the year, so many of us participated in Above and Beyond. In the last couple weeks, our global missions partner and Bible translator, Ryan Hardy, orchestrated the installation of of clean water and so we sent the money and they purchased these tanks uh, and where the tribe is located is on the top of the mountain they told me that they had to max out the helicopters they flew these tanks to the top of the mountain they leveled the ground and they began installing the tanks and get this 10 minutes before they finished the installing of the tanks and just after they finished 10 minutes later God sent rain it was pretty amazing yeah yeah Right. And now, uh, we did this to prepare their hearts for the gospel message, but you, you probably, you maybe you know this, that right now in the world, 2,300 people die every day because they don't have access to clean water. And so our sacrifice is actually truly saving lives. So Ryan and his team have already translated uh, so many things. They've given them an alphabet. They didn't have an alphabet in their own language. Uh, they've translated Jonah and Luke and James and Philemon into their language. And then Ryan shot me an early morning text a couple weeks ago or a week ago. He said the impact of this project has actually been more than they even hoped for. They truly felt that God had met their needs. That's why they were singing praises. And so, get this, for the days leading up to the dedication, they began repenting and praying, and they began reconciling with God and each other, and then they began to celebrate. See, when we're generous, we can truly change lives forever. I, I want to thank you for making this happen, and I want to encourage you to be generous here at Victory, because here at Victory, we see money differently than most people do. We see money as a tool. We see money as fuel for doing our part and bringing heaven to earth. So when we sacrifice, that's proof God is glorified. So you can participate in all that God is doing here. Uh, you can give in the app or give online or through the bank. That's how our family does it. Or you can help us fuel life change by using the offering boxes in the back as you exit or down the stairs. And as you prepare to give, I wanna welcome my wife and daughter. We help me welcome them to the platform. Happy Mother's Day, sweetie. Hey, thanks. Hey, we just want to welcome you to Victory this morning, and we do want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you're here. Yeah, and we want to celebrate all of you moms out there, so let's give them a round of applause. Happy Great. Mother's Day, Mom. Thanks, babe. Uh, we love moms because you guys get your kids to church, um, sometimes not on time. Uh, I like to be fashionably late, that's fine, but at least you moms are getting them here, so thank you so much. Now, have you ever noticed that moms are always repeating themselves? Go clean your room, take out the trash, make your bed. I'm glad you've been listening to me all those years, babe. But anyways, it's actually true. We moms have to do so much. Um, how many of you moms have to get up every morning and say, get in the car? 
get in the car. Are you in the car? Get in the car. Then you have to ask them, is your seatbelt on? Do you have your seatbelt on? Did you buckle up? And then you find out that they forgot their backpack in the house just to unbuckle, get back in, in the house. So you can yell the whole same thing again about getting in the car. Every morning, I have to deal with that with at least one of my children. And then they ask those stupid questions like, um, hey, which car are we taking? The one that's in the garage, which one? The black one we take every morning. You know, you just wonder if your kids are ever listening to you. It's true, but dads, you have one up on us. If a kid does not get in the car the first time, what do you guys do? You drive away, and then you've got a kid with a backpack on running after the car. They're never leaving you guys again. They're gonna make sure they're in the car. So you leave them in the driveway. Dads are not always as caring as us moms, and being a mom is tough, especially for someone like me when I have five kids to hey, take care of. You don't have five kids, you have four. I always count your dad as my fifth kid. <laughs> Anybody who knows him would agree, correct? Okay, but anyways, here at Victory, we appreciate our moms. So moms, if you haven't noticed yet, we have a gift for you out in the lobby. We also have a little bit of something for your sweet tooth. And of course, like all moms love, we have a photo op. Sorry, kids. You have hey, to take a picture of it. guess what you're getting. What am I getting? It's right out there. Thanks, babe. Just make sure you get out there before the end of second service or it'll all be gone. Well, let's change the subject. Yeah. Here at Victory, we don't only celebrate moms, we also celebrate our first-time guests. If it's your first time here, text NEW to 317-576-2288. Or if you're in the building, stop by the Connection Center. We want to give you a free gift and some more information about Victory. And if you've been here before, we also want to know that you're here. Check in on the Victory app to help us connect and better care for your family. Yeah, at Victory, our vision is to connect people back to God. And we have many different ways to do that, but one of the ways we do that is through our Victory app. Now, we've got a lot of awesome things coming up here at Victory. We've got our Summer Surge. We also have BBS, and that is all online right now to register for. But we also have our Victory Christian Preschool enrollment is coming up already. I can't believe it. So if you guys are more interested about what we're doing, we have a this week tab on our victory app and so just hit that hit that every week and see what's going on here at victory again we are so glad that you chose to spend mother's day with us yes happy mother's day to all you moms and let's watch this mother's day video i'm so bored i wish i had something to do <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look, an empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull out our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, ah! fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Somebody want to come use the bathroom while I'm in here? <laughs>
Being a mom is tough. We want to welcome and thank and celebrate all the moms out there. If you are a mom, want to be a mom, going to be a mom, miss your mom or had a mom, that's everyone. Uh, We're so honored that you spend this Mother's Day uh, with us. And and I just, before we really jump into the whole thing today, I just want to vocalize, I want to say out loud that I'm aware uh, that for some of us, this is a, a reminder that it's a difficult day, that your mom isn't here. Or that no matter how hard you tried, you never really got your shot at being a mom. And for today, if some of this, today is maybe a painful reminder of what is not or will never be. And for some, the Mother's Days may be difficult. And just like this little succulent, our, our prayer for you is that your life and, and your faith would actually flourish in the middle of a very difficult season. That's what I want. I, I want us to leave today with actually confidence that God knows that God sees and that God cares for you. And since it's Mother's Day, we're gonna get to a passage. We're gonna go all girl power. We're gonna look at the life of a woman who I'm telling you, she will inspire our faith. And and I want, I can't stress this enough. Like just like we are in the middle of our story, like we don't know how our life is gonna play out. She was in the very middle of her story. And in the text, you will see that this woman was overwhelmed with life. She was overwhelmed with the decisions that she had to make. And the responsibility uh, that had been thrown her way was overwhelming. She felt unequipped to face what was next in her life. And transparently, her life felt hopeless. So if you've ever experienced the loss of an opportunity, maybe the loss of a marriage, the loss of a loved one, she could raise her hand and say, me too. I know exactly how you feel. You're not alone. Not only was she going through all all of that, she was on the brink of losing her two sons. Her life was desolate. But like this little succulent, we can be inspired and challenged by the beauty of her faith in a terrible time in the middle of her life. And this is so important. She did not know the end of the story. She could not read the end of her story. She didn't know how her life was going to turn out, but right in the middle of her story, she had faith. And so the question I have for us today is, what would a faith look like? And what would faith look like in a person's life if they really did have the kind of faith that Jesus commanded us to pursue? Like a faith that no matter what happens, a faith that could flourish in desolate places. What would faith look like in a person's life if they really did that kind of have that kind of awe-inspiring, overwhelming faith that Jesus commanded us to pursue? What would, ha- what would have to change in your life to have a, a no matter what kind of faith? What would have to change in your life to be able to be confident enough to say, no matter what you're facing, I believe that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. What would have to change in your life to not just say that and not just kind of believe that intellectually, but act it out and live differently because of it? I believe that God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he could do. I just wonder, how, how does a person get there? Now, if if you're not a Jesus follower and you've ever struggled with faith, the question that so many of us have asked before is simply this, why should I trust God? Like, why why should you actually even trust God? And here's an answer that's, here's a reason you shouldn't trust God. You shouldn't trust God, not because God grants our deepest desires. Like, have you ever prayed for God to, to make something happen that he didn't make happen? Even if it was a good thing for other people, maybe it's an unselfish thing. I'm telling you, the foundation of our faith is not in God being a big Santa Claus in the sky. That, that's not biblical faith. It's, it's not God's a genie in the bi- bottle. You got to rub him the right way. Like he's not asking for that, right? That faith won't last. But, but in your life, why should you trust God? Here's another reason you shouldn't trust God. Not, not because of our ability to understand or interpret what God is doing in the middle of our crisis. That if we lean our faith against anything connected with what's going on in our life right now, the things that we're dealing with in our life right now, if our life gets better or worse, if the money comes in, or if there's no money to pay the bills, if cancer is cured or the person that we love is destroyed by that terrible disease, cancer, if we lean our lives against the conditions of our circumstances, it will just be a matter of time until something happens in our life that we don't like or we don't understand. And that's when our faith just hits a wall. And when that happens enough times, your faith, my faith won't last. We will bail on God. And you'll just go find something or someone else that you think that you can trust. And that's a lot of our stories, right? I thought God would and he didn't. I thought God would never, but it feels like he 
did. I thought that if I did this, it would kind of force or manipulate God to do that. If I prayed really hard, if I stopped that particular sin, if I showed up regularly to church, that would guarantee that God would then do his part. And it doesn't feel like God's keeping his end of the deal. And that's where a lot of us have been. I'm telling you, these mindsets will lead us to a crisis of faith. And that's not what I thought God was gonna be like. And when the first followers of Jesus asked themselves, you just need to, why should I trust God? When they asked that question, when they talked about faith, you need to know that those first followers of Jesus had rough lives. They had unanswered prayers, but it did not shake their faith. Why? Because when they asked, why should I trust God? Their faith was rooted in and founded in the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. Their faith actually leaned against Jesus and nothing else. They, their faith propped, was propped up against Jesus and no one else. That meant that no matter what was going on in their lives, no matter what God's answer was to their prayers, because of a day that they saw it with their own eyes, that God knows, that God sees, and that God cares for me, because Jesus was nailed to a cross, and he died, and he was buried in a tomb, and then three days later, God raised him from the dead as proof that gave them all the confidence that they needed. That God is God of love. That God does keep all of his promises. That's why they trusted God. Jesus' life was proof that God was on a rescue mission. That's why they could say, oh, I trust that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. That's how, uh, this is how they defined faith. They said this, they have faith, it's confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Meaning, it hasn't happened yet. And because, it, right, we haven't seen it yet because it hasn't happened yet. But because I have faith, I'm absolutely sure that I can trust the promises of God. Because I have faith, I can have confidence that even though I don't know how it can happen, it seems impossible. I actually believe that God can do something about the things in my life. I believe, I trust, I have faith that no matter what I'm facing, I believe that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. And so when life gets difficult, you know, when their life got difficult, do you know what they pointed to? To realize that God was in control, that he was loving. They had seared in their minds the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. Their faith leaned against, was propped up against Jesus and nothing else. And even though they were in the middle of their story, even though things seemed hopeless, even though their life looked desolate, they had faith. Now, if you're a Jesus follower, the idea of faith should be really important to you. You shouldn't be here going, like, I've heard this before. Like, no, because the, the, the writer of Hebrews informs us, he says this, without faith, it is, what's that word? Impossible to please God. So if it's impossible to please God, this should be important to us. So my question is, how do you know if you really have faith? Like, how, how, do, you, how do you really know if you really have faith? Is it just simply a belief system? Is that faith? Is, is faith just an agreement to a collection of facts and information? Is that the kind of faith that can inspire generations and change the world? No. It's not just about believing a certain number of facts. In fact, that's not biblical faith. Faith is, is more than saying, I believe some stuff in the Bible is probably true. I said, how, how do you know? How do you know if you really have faith? Because when Jesus talked about faith, faith was having a level of confidence and the level of assurance and who Jesus is and what Jesus says is true. But here's the part that so many of us leave out, that real faith, real faith results in life change. True faith results in acting and choosing and behaving and living differently. Hear me, not perfection. Not perfection in your life, but progress towards living your life as if God has to show up. That's where faith meets the road. If you're gonna follow Jesus, you need to know there's gonna be moments in following Jesus you will feel lonely. You will look around and it'll feel like nobody else is following Jesus. Everybody else is doing something different because Jesus will call you to make decisions to live differently than everybody else in your life. And if you're gonna follow Jesus, I just wanna warn you, he will lead you to dangerous places. He will lead you to places that you might not wanna go, that if he doesn't show up, you're in trouble. So how do you know if you really have faith? Just ask yourself this question. Am I really living as if God has to show up in my life? Or am I just playing it safe? Does God have to show up in how I'm responding in faith or am I hedging my bets? 
Is it Jesus and my happiness or is it Jesus and nothing else? Because the kind of faith that flourishes in desolate places is the faith, the kind of faith that has the foundation on the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. And I'm telling you, it is uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable place to be, to really have faith, to say, God, I'm lonely. God, I'm hungry. God, I'm overwhelmed. God, I'm broke. God, if you don't come through, I am done. But God, I believe no matter what I'm going through, you are who you say you are, and you can do what you say you can do. I, I, I'll admit, being in the middle of your story is a scary place. Like when we're in the middle of our story, and we don't, can't see the end. Things like clarity and hope are hard to come by. When we're in the middle of our story, when we're surrounded by uncertainty, it's difficult to know, like, is, how is my faith going? But I'm telling you, you will be inspired by the life of a woman who was in trouble, a woman who, uh, who, who, was, uh, who had faith. Uh, this account took place in Israel around 849 BC. This was around the time that Homer in Greece wrote the Iliad and Odyssey. So this isn't once upon a time. No, in 849 BC, it was a crazy time to try to live for God. The future of the nation of Israel was actually unsure that during this time, a majority of the nation of Israel did not worship Yahweh as God. In fact, evil Queen Jezebel is hunting down God's prophets. And so the government, get this, the government that God established had turned from God. Sound familiar? And in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the unknown, in 2 Kings chapter 4, we hear about a lady, and we don't know her name, but if you have your Bible or mobile device, 2 Kings chapter 4, and here she is in verse 1, it says, the wife, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets, right? So the wife of a prophet that was going to be under persecution, she cried out to Elisha, and Elisha was known as the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He's the greatest prophet of his time. To, to hear her, uh, hear, do, what she was doing here is she was like going to God's representative here on earth. So she goes to God's representative, Elisha, and she says, your servant, my husband, is dead. <laughs> Right? And you know that he had revered the Lord. Now, not only that, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. So just to time out, this lady has a huge problem. It's a legitimate problem. If you were to try to put yourself in her sandals for just a second, you have to understand her situation is bad. And she's probably very confused. She's probably rightly frustrated. Because here's what she's just explained. Her husband, who for years and years and years served the Lord and loved the Lord and sacrificed for the Lord and obeyed the Lord and worshiped the Lord and led his family to worship the Lord, this good, good, godly man, he died. And now she's in panic because she has no husband in a culture where women had no rights. Now, we don't know this for sure, but the Jewish tradition says that this woman was the widow of Obadiah. And Obadiah was a prophet who wrote the Old Testament book. Obadiah, right? Not very creative, but he did it. So, but the tradition says that the reason Obadiah was broke was because when evil Queen Jezebel was hunting down and killing the prophets of God, Obadiah took out a huge loan. And he used that loan and all of his money to hide a hundred of God's prophets from arrest. But now he's dead. So from her perspective, this is, God, I trusted you. God, we sacrificed for you. God, don't you know? Don't you see? Don't, don't you care? Don't you care what I did for you? So she goes to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And not only am I dealing with that, but he died before we could pay back that very big loan. And now his creditor is, is coming to take my two boys as his slave. So I'm a widow I'm a single mom of two young boys and my dead husband's creditors are on their way to my house to take the only thing in this world left that I actually even care about. There's no money. There's no hope. Have you ever been there? And just so you know, this is way different than, well, I guess her life's gonna be difficult. <laughs> right? This is way different than, bummer. You can't win them all. Good luck. You know, this is a death sentence. And if somebody doesn't step in to help her, she will lose everything. Have you ever been there? And so what did she do? Where did she start? Well, let me just tell you where she didn't start, right? 
Her life is in chaos. She's about to lose everything. So what does she not do? Well, how about this? She doesn't go to all of her girlfriends and say, hey, I want your best advice. What, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? Let's just all take a vote. You ready? One, two, three, go. You know, like, she doesn't do that. How about this? She doesn't also, she also doesn't hire a lawyer to fight for her protection. She doesn't go to a counselor to help her deal with the trauma in her life. She doesn't go take your sons in and say, hey, let's come up with a plan. We're going to devise a plan. And I just want to time out. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. There's a place for all of those things. But what you need to look at is what she did first. What she did first. Where did she start first? The very first thing she does is she goes to God represented by Elisha the prophet. And so life happened to her. And her very first thought is... If you're going to live a life of faith, I need to talk to God about this. The, I, he, he needs to handle this. So, so my husband and I, we trusted God. We revered God for years and years and years. And I know that God is good. And I know that he will do what he needs to do. And I know he has the power to fix it, which is by our definition, faith. She said, I believe that God is who he says he is. And he can do what he says he can do. And she knew that God could make a way when there was no way. That if God didn't show up, her life was over. Now you need to realize this wasn't like a prayer request and then she went and sat on the couch waiting for God to fix it. Like no, she, here's, here, she's meeting with, here's what she's meeting with God with, about. Hey, hey God, what are you and I going to do together about my problem? So, so this is not God, <clears throat> I'm gonna sit on the couch and just pray that you fix my marriage. Yep, nope, you're not gonna do that? Okay, like that? That's not the prayer, right? That's not what she's saying. She's also not saying, hey God, you stay up in heaven and I'll deal with you later. I'm just gonna try to work this out my own way. She didn't do that either. What she's saying, here's her prayer. Maybe it can be your prayer later this week. Hey God, what are we going to do about this, what's facing us? God, what are we gonna do about this thing together? Hey God, wh how, how, how do you want me to move? What do you want me to do? Now look in verse two. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? So he's speaking for God. Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she says, your servant has nothing here at all, she said. Now it's time out. It's a typical response, right? When things are going rough in our lives and we're in a panic and we're trying to figure out, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And then somebody says something to you like, well, what can you do about it? You wanna punch them, right? The first thought that comes to your mind is nothing. I've tried everything. That's why I'm coming to you. I have nothing, right? And so write this down if you're taking notes. Nothing's not true. Nothing's not true. I have nothing is not a true statement. Listen, God knows what you have. And if he commands you to do something, say, I can't do it because I have nothing. That's not true. You need to know that God's not going up in heaven. Going, well, that's just too bad that you have nothing. Because if you had 100000 in the bank, I could really solve your problem, Right? He's not doing that. God's never looked at a person and said, hey, I could help you. I could keep my promise to you if you just had a better job. Now, he's the all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe. God's not looking at you thinking, hey, if, if I could help you if you hadn't met, screwed up your past. I could help you if you were just a little bit smarter, if you just finished college. I could really help you if you hadn't made so many mistakes in your life, if you had a lot more of this or a little less of that. All right, maybe then maybe I could help you, but I'm sorry, I can't help you. That's never, ever, ever gonna happen. He's gonna look at your life, as messy and dark as it might seem, and as this can't be fixed as you might think it is, and say, hey, what do you have and your first response is going to be nothing. Nothing. That's not true. I wonder if Elisha looks at her and goes, really? <laughs> nothing? And she continues, except this a little small jar of olive oil. Now, the Hebrew in this account actually cues us into this detail. This Hebrew word uh, was meaning anointing oil right? So, so this wasn't like oil for cooking. This was an expensive priestly anointing oil. This was the kind of oil that she would have used or her husband would have used to bless people or anoint kings. It was her husband's oil, but he's dead. And this little jar of oil is all I have. I have nothing else. And here's what I'm sure this lady is thinking because, I, because this is probably what I would be thinking. What good is this? <laughs> One small little jar of olive oil can't even touch my problem. Now, just a quick timeout. Elisha represents God. 
And I, I want you to know that he, God does not respond to her the way you think God res, would respond to you. He doesn't scold her or tell her that she should have had more faith. He doesn't say, well, if you just have prayed harder or if you just stopped messing up, then you wouldn't be in this situation. He doesn't scold her or shame her. That's what many of us think that God would do to us. I'm so disappointed in you. You should have just trusted me. Why can't you just be more like those other Jesus followers? That's not what he does. No, Elisha, as this crying mom who's just buried the love of her life, is about to see her two boys hauled off into slavery. She stands in front of him, a blubbering mess. And Elisha looks at this woman who came to God with her problem in faith. And he sees she's living her life as if God has to show up or she's done. She's as good as dead. And when it looks like there's no way, when it looks like there's no way out, Elisha knows what God is about to do. He's going to blow her mind. I want you to look at this. Here's what Elisha said. Here's the plan. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for these empty jars. And don't ask for just a few. I love that, right? They then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all of the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side, right? Now, I just want to take a time out. I want you to look at these words. I want to confess to you, that is dumb. And she pours out what she has. That means she won't have any left. Elisha's instructions don't make any sense. Can we all just agree that, hey, just pour out what you have left. That seems impossible, right? If she were to go tell her neighbors, hey, God told me I should go pour out all of my oil. They wouldn't understand. It doesn't make any sense. So, so God, you want me to, to start following you, having faith in you by pouring out what little I have? Why would she do that? Why would she do that? The only answer you can have is because she had faith. You have the kind of faith that obeys and acts upon what God is telling her to do, even when the rest of the world would look at her and say, that doesn't make any sense at all. When God tells you to do something, don't ask your neighbors, shut the door and get to work. Now, I don't know how you picture this, the whole thing, but I, I, you picture her go like, dumping the whole thing in. And she, like, I, I picture just like a, a little bit of a drop at a time, like looking in there, you know, because that, that's how faith works. She did a little bit by little bit. And she trusted God little bit by little bit. And I want you to check out what happens next. They brought the, the jars to her and she kept pouring. And when all of the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. Right? And she's probably thinking, I wish I'd asked for more jars, right? I, I had faith, but I wish I had like a tanker truck of faith. Like so, so, so she went and told the man of God and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left. I want you to notice that God always fights for those who can't fight for themselves. God values every heartbeat, even the unborn heartbeats. God values the lives that society has rejected. And so this crying mom who has just buried the love of her life is about to see her two boys haul off into slavery. She stands in front of him, this blubbering mess. She's living as if God has to show up and she's poured out what little bit of life, that represented life, what little bit of life she had because she had faith. But I believe that God is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. And you know, we're not really talking about these clay pots and oil, right? Because here's what I, I think. I think a lot of us have what we would maybe call faith, but our faith isn't alive because we've attached it to what happens after we die. That's all we think about when we think about faith or what happens after we die. Because people think, uh, we think it's because we believe a few truths now that we get to be in heaven with Jesus forever. And that's not how Jesus defined faith which would explain why a lot of us would describe our faith and our walk with God as not very powerful. And many of us would, what would describe our relationship with God as frustrating because that we keep on waiting for God to do something for us. We keep on waiting for God to move in our direction to help us. And here's a statement that's so convicting, I almost left it out of the message, but what if it's God who's actually waiting on us? Let that sink in. What if God is the one who's waiting on you or waiting on me? He says, I have so much for you. I have so much I want you to do. I, so much for your life I have for you. But I've already told you what to do. You just haven't done it yet. 
But if you were just to take whatever little bit you have, and if you were just to pour it out, I promise you wouldn't be able to contain what I'm about to do in your life. See, what if God's message to you is I have gallons and gallons. I have an ocean full of this precious oil I want to give you, but you're just holding on to that little jar because you've determined that you have nothing except this. And somehow that little jar is going to actually take care of you. I'm telling you, it won't. It can't. But what if God has something better for you, but you just can't have it until you pour out what little bit you have left? I know you can't see it from here, but sitting here right now, you don't know how it would happen if you actually listened to God in that area of your life. And if you felt that way, you wouldn't be the first. You'd be like most of us. Let's just get really honest. You have a problem in your life and you don't know how how you're gonna fix it and you need God to get involved in your life and this part of your life because you don't know what you're gonna do. You're telling God what he needs to do. And so you start waiting on God to fix it. But what if God is actually waiting on you to act, to obey in faith what he's already told you to do? But it's not what you thought he would tell you to do. And it's not really what you planned on doing and it's not really what you wanted to do and you don't even think like how how would that even help let me just ask what if the widow would respond to the way that so many of us respond what would happen to her life the answer is she would have lost everything including what was most important to her life, her two sons. She would have got to keep the oil for just a little bit, but then she would have ultimately lost it. And the answer is not she would have lost it because God isn't good and God doesn't keep his promises to take care of her. That's why she lost everything. That's not the answer. No, it, it would have been because she, would have, she wouldn't let go of a stupid little jar of oil. I mean, just say it a different way. She, she put more faith and this little stupid jar of oil to take care of her than she did the God of the universe who promised he would take care of her. All he, she had to do was follow him. And so my question for you is simply this. Is it possible that you have some part of your life where you're doing the same thing with God? Is that at least possible? God already told us what to do. God already told us how we need to respond. And he's just waiting on us. We're not waiting on him. We're just holding the jar. Josh, can you be more specific? Sure, I can. Thanks, thanks for asking. Just remember, you asked for it, right? Some of the most stressful things that we deal with is money. Right? We just keep praying and praying. God, send me more money. Send me more money. Send me more money. And God, if you send me this, then I will do that, right? That's, that's, God looks back at us and goes, I've already given you a ton of money. It's the wealthiest nation that's ever existed. Like, you haven't been faithful with what I've given you. Why would I trust you with more? Why don't you just go pour out what you have? God, that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) I I know. I don't. If you struggle with that, you're not alone. Because the most common prayer is, God, if if, if you do this first, then I will do this. Then I'll have faith in you. And God's response to you and God's response to, to me is simply, I've already gone first. I sent my one and only son to die for you. I've already demonstrated I'm on your side. Just let go of your little jar. How about that? I mean, money is one. Relationships is another. Let me talk to all the single people, all the single people. All right. Single, single again, not married, right? Here's maybe what you're praying. God, send me somebody in my life. Send me somebody in my life. Send me somebody. I'd be okay with a nine, but I'm really praying for a 10. God, send me somebody in my life. The last 27 haven't worked, right? But God is looking at you going, why would I send somebody else in your life? You're not honoring me with your sexuality now. You haven't honored the last 12 people with your sexuality. Why would I let you break another person's heart? See, you take your sexuality and you give that to me and then we'll see what's next. But God, that doesn't make sense. I know. Do you trust me? God, if you do this first, then I will do. And God says, I've already done this. You can trust me. You can trust me. And I, I remember growing up, we were singing a, a hymn. It was written by Judson Van uh, Deventon. Is it written in 1896? I wasn't alive back then, but 126 years ago. And here's the words to it. Maybe you grew up singing it. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And to which 
It's such a beautiful thought. But if I was honest, there's so many times I would be singing, I surrender some. <laughs> I surrender part of it. I surrender this, but not this. And all the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God of the universe says, hey, trust me. Follow me. But here we are just gripping on to the stupid little jar that, that does not have the power to change, heal, or fix anything that we're going through. We're just going to get ready to sing this song. Uh, and, and I want you just to take your fist. And I want you to clench them up like this. I want you to picture it, that one thing maybe in your life that you feel God say, hey, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about that. Spirit say, I'm talking about that. As you sing this song, it's because it's being played, just maybe slowly open up your hands. Say, God, I want to trust you with that area of my life. I, I need you to show up in this area of my life as we all stand and sing this song. Can you imagine if those weren't just lyrics to a song, but that was a prayer, it was a statement to God in our life. And you remember what I said, this, this oil represented in the Old Testament was anointing oil, so her husband would have used that oil to anoint a king. And you understand, when you and I pour out our lives, we're saying, Jesus, I'm gonna give you all of this. I'm anointing you as king over my life, king over my money, king over my time, king over my relationships, king over my sexuality. I'm going to pour it all out and I don't know what's on the other end except you. 
And what we're saying is, God, you are my king, you are my leader, you are my savior. I'm anointing you. All of, I'm giving it all to you. I freely give it to you. And what if God is just waiting for us to say, I trust you, even though I don't see what's on the other side. I can't see it from here, but I can see you. And when we do that, our faith blooms in the midst of a difficult place. Would you pray with me? So God, right now, we don't want to just sing songs. We don't want to just say we believe, but we want to step out in faith in our lives, which means we want to obey you in a part of our life where we really haven't been obeying you before. You just, we've just been asking us to fix all, I've been asking you to fix all my problems, but we just keep creating more of them. And so God, I'm just asking you to fix, not my whole life, but this one little part of my life that I keep holding on to, I need to get you involved with. And so God, you've already gone first in my direction by giving us Jesus. And I know you're waiting on me. So I surrender my life and my mess to you. I know that's risky, but it's worth the risk because I believe on the other side of obedience is hope and peace more than I could imagine. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, every one of us has a next step. If you want prayer for stuff going on in your line, go out the, or out in your life, go out the door and to the left. If you are watching us out there online, text NEXT to 317-576-2288. And next week, you're not gonna wanna miss it. We're kicking off a new series called Unlikely Heroes. And as you leave this time together, as we leave, we get to go be the church in the community. We get to model what it looks like to live a big, bold faith. And so I, I'm praying this, this week that you could say with your life. I believe that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. Have a great week.